Hello and welcome into the Minnesota Basketball Party. We come to you every single Wednesday with Wolves Stock. I'm Ben Beacon, host of the Locked On Wolves podcast, subbing in hosting the basketball party for Sam Ekstrom today. And today, in the wake of Anthony Edwards' career-high 51-point performance on Tuesday night against the Wizards, a comeback win for the Wolves after being 21 points down to one of the worst teams in the league, we're going to look ahead to Wolves Nuggets tonight. We're going to talk about an, what's sure to be an exciting finish to the race for the number one seed in the Western Conference. We're going to talk a little bit about some takeaways from the weekend, a tough loss to the Suns and a big win over the Lakers on Sunday. Um, and also Carl Anthony Towns looking ahead to his return this week. We'll give a few college basketball thoughts as well. Lots to get to here today on the show. Without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce the panel and we'll start with uh, Jack. Hi, I'm Jack Borman, Editor-in-Chief of Canis Hoopus, co-host of the Lockdown Wolves postcast with my man, Luke Inman. And, and like Ben said, we're going to get into talking about Carl Anthony Towns and what he might look like in his return. And, and I'll be talking a little bit about what I'm hoping to see from him on the floor, regardless of you know what the context of the games may look like. And I'm Ron Johnson, former Gophers and NFL wide receiver, avid basketball fan. I want to talk about 50 in front of 50. But also, I feel bad for the Iowa Wolves players. They have to live in Iowa, but I'll explain why. <laughs> Always tough to follow that, but I'm Reggie Wilson, sports director at CARE 11. And you know what? Legs or no legs. And it's back, baby. Yeah, uh, and I'm Ben Beacon, host of the Lockdown Wolves podcast daily on uh, Lockdown. You could listen to this, the basketball party on the Lockdown Wolves audio feed, and um, of course, Lockdown Wolves on YouTube as well, every single day, Monday through Friday. Talking about Ant and his performance against the Wizards, um, I mean, there's so many different ways. Let's start there because it was a career high. It was the way I described it on Lockdown Wolves was almost a methodical 51 points. Like, there's no such thing as a quiet 51 point performance, but this wasn't like hey, he had a 30-point quarter or, or like, you know, he just went nuts in the fourth to pull him to the win. It was just kind of like, it, obviously the second half was bigger than the first, but it was like a perfect shot mix, you know, twos versus threes versus getting to the line. It was efficient. He didn't turn the ball over. Um, in my mind, this was just kind of, if like, there's not a not perfect 50 point game, although the Wolves lost in Cat's 60 plus point game earlier this year. But <laughs> this this was a a pretty perfect 50 plus point game. Uh, what are your take? What are your take? Or what's your take on uh, on Ant's performance, Jack? Yeah, I mean, I, I was there. It was a ton of fun uh, to, to be there in the building for it. Uh, fans certainly were, were scoreboard watching throughout the second half in terms of just how high that uh, you know that performance could fly. But for Ant, I, he didn't fight the game. He didn't let anything you know, kind of put push him off course in terms of the way that he was playing his game. And we've seen with how efficient of a playmaker he's been in the last handful of games that uh, it was nice to see him continue that, even though he certainly would have had, you know, free reign to just shoot the ball whenever he wanted to and just hunt a number. And he was efficient from all over the floor. Chris Finch said post game last night that getting 50 is not about you know, doing any of that stuff, hunting in the game, you know, hunting shots or anything. It's about being efficient in everything that you do. And he was certainly that. He shot 59% from the floor, 46% from three. <clears throat> he really got it going downhill. I mean, he was 11 of 13 in the paint, which is an awesome number for Ant. And when he didn't score, he got fouled, right? He was 11 of 11 from the free throw line. But all 11 of those came in the first half. And that pushes us into pretty unique territory and that Anthony Edwards had 30 points in the second half without making a single free throw. And only one other player in, in the NBA has done that in a half this season. And that's Anthony Edwards, you know, basketball idol, Kevin Durant. So pretty cool company for, for him to be in. And, and like I said, with the playmaking, you know, yeah, he had 51, which was, which was incredible, but it's now the third time in his last four games that he's had at least 26 points, six assists and two or fewer turnovers while maintaining good shooting efficiency. So it's not just the scoring for Ant, it's also the playmaking and the more that he can weaponize kind of that scoring to, to make the playmaking a little bit easier for him. I think the more impactful of a player we're going to see, and it's and it's a great time that we're, we're kind of seeing that peaking at the right time heading into the playoffs. Yeah, and Jack, you mentioned his shot selection. Like, I mean, he was, I think it was six of six on paint shots outside the restricted area. So, and he was 0 of three on non paint twos. So it wasn't like a steady diet of these tough mid range jumpers. He shot a couple, but they were in the paint. They were essentially free throw line and in six of six on non restricted area paint twos and 0 of three 
on on non paint twos. So the shot mix only shooting three non paint twos is a really big deal for Anthony Edwards. So to see that shot mix, you can uh, you know Chris Fitch was obviously really happy about that after the game. Uh, Ron, your take on Ant's performance? Yeah, well, <clears throat> first off, I'm going to talk about the Iowa Wolves later, so I'm not going to. We'll, we'll stick around later for that in the shot clock uh, segment, people. Uh, but when you look at Fifty Cent, so Fifty Cent was in the building, and Anthony Edwards put up fifty. I mean, that's that's just poetic right there. I don't know if 50 has room to write Anthony Edwards into his next show. We know Anthony Edwards is an actor, uh, but he's got to put Anthony Edwards in his next show somehow. I don't know if he comes in as like the the local hooper uh, that, that, that they're trying to keep out of trouble or something, but 50 has to find a way to put him in there. But to score 51, and, and I think uh, Jackie kind of hit on it, it was, it was like a steady dose it was like death by a thousand cuts it wasn't one of those nights where everybody on sports center because he scored 51 and right now they're talking about are the warriors the most dangerous team in the west because they just beat the lakers we're talking about an eight and a nine seed game you have the one and the two playing today and their topic for today is should the west be worried about the warriors that's what kind of crap we have to deal with and so when you think about this with the Timberwolves and what Anthony Edwards did, honestly, I, I think it just makes everybody even more excited about the playoff run because you're going to get capped back. You see Nas Reed can score at will whenever he wants. But last night, Nikhil Alexander-Walker was his helper. You had Rudy Gobert as his helper. So it's 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 kind of cool to see different guys take on that role of like, look, Cat's not here. Let me let me go off. Let me figure. And they're, they're kind of letting that guy get going. Like, it, 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 I'm not going to say it's pick up basketball. It's smart basketball. But it does feel like ever since that 60-point game of Carlin D. Towns, they've all kind of figured out, you know what? Whoever's night it is, let's move it to that guy, but let's not force it. And that's what you're seeing. You're not seeing them force shot. Anthony Edwards is not forcing. He's hunting, but he's not forcing. Same with the kill Alexander Walker. He's not forcing it. Uh, Caitlin Clark, I don't know if you guys saw towards the end of her game, she forced a couple shots. Like she hit one three and then she came back down and she's like clapping, clapping, like, give me the ball, give me the ball. I, I, I feel it, I feel it. And she shoots like a half court three and absolutely like dings it off the rim. And so that's forcing it. You don't see that from the Wolves and that's what smart play playoff teams do. We'll talk a little bit more, but when you look down these last four teams, Warriors, Lakers, Suns, Kings, whether you're one or two, you're going to have a tough matchup. And so that's why this, this playoff run is going to be interesting. I don't want the Suns. I would rather, I mean, uh, unlike Sports Center, I would rather take the Warriors. But Anthony Edwards, fifty in front of fifty, like that. That that's what movie scripts are about. Like we we've seen that happen before. Uh, forget baddies, put millionaires and billionaires in front of Anthony Edwards, and he'll show out. Yeah, and and uh, seven assists to two turnovers in this game. To your point, uh, both you guys talked about him not forcing things, and that's another example. Like sometimes he gets into like you know guys lo teams load up on him, and he tries too hard to play make if you know that's the thing too and, and in this game i thought it was the right mix uh reggie your thoughts it was interesting too because i feel like there was some very tough um shot making during that that stretch as well especially in the fourth quarter he was just i mean i think these are things that we just kind of come to expect from ant just because he has shown the ability to make a lot of tough shots but like some of those shots were not very easy shots to make, and they were trying, uh, the Wizards were, to actually put some pressure on him from a defensive standpoint. And he was just like, no, it's all good. You know, fade away here. You know, uh, you're going to double me because you don't want me to shoot a three? Uh, I'll just drive to the to the cup and, and lay it up, and you can't do anything about it. Um, I think what was interesting was, you know, with the 51, uh, Grady said something last night on the broadcast, and I was just like, what? And he was just like, yeah, Ant scored 51, and the Wolves needed all 51. And I was just like, but did they? But then, you know, you kind of look back at the at the um, the box, and they were only plus six with Ant in the game. They were plus 27 with Nikhil and his 23 points. But it was quite the efficient night from Ant, um, six of 13 from three. And, you know, we've talked about his struggles um, where he couldn't really buy a three. Um, over the last like week and a half or, or so, went 11 for 11 from the line. And I know he's been kind of crying a little bit more about fouls this year than than what we have grown accustomed to from him. And so I, I'm pretty sure he's pretty happy with uh, being able to get to the, the line 11 times. But I think the only thing that was concerning for me about the performance was 
there were times like when he had 47, when he had 49, I was just like, all right, that's good. Take him out, take him out, take him out. Back to back tomorrow in Denver, high altitude. Like, take him out, take him out. Finchy was like, no, no, you know, he's he's so close. You know, just let him play, let him play. And then like with like a minute and a half left in the game, he finally takes him out. Um, I just hope that, you know, with a guy who looks like he needed a breather, um, as we were talking about it, like last week, a few weeks ago, I think um, that was a tough thing that he continued to play in a game where it seemed like it was pretty much in hand late. And so hopefully that doesn't have any residuals uh, tonight against Denver. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the Denver game here in just a little bit. I want to um, shift gears slightly. I mean, the the first part of of this game against the Wizards was obviously, um, I don't know, concerning is a really strong word considering, you know, they won the game by double digits and, um, you know, it was it's it was a quarter. But they gave up 44 points in the first quarter of the Wizards, combination of hot shooting from Washington. And the Wolves missed a lot of open shots. I actually thought offensively the Wolves looked OK. They just missed shots. Um, so it was really more it was really more about the defensive issues in the first quarter. Um, but then you think back, the Lakers game was was mostly all good. Obviously, no LeBron in that game Sunday and, and, and Anthony Davis only played in the first quarter before he left with injury. But then all the way back to the Phoenix game la- happened last Friday since, you know, since the last time we had a, a basketball party show. And there were obviously some offensive issues in that game. So it's not like it's been any one issue for better or for worse over the last three games when the Wolves have struggled. Um, but thinking back to the Phoenix game, it was offensive flow. It was shot making. It was it was a little bit of everything. Um, and then, you know, in this in this game, it was defense early over the last three games. And, and you know, you guys could pick if there's a, an individual game you want to speak more on the Phoenix game, obviously being the most concerning. Is there anything as we're heading toward the playoff that that playoffs that you know you're worried worried about trends that the wolves have been on over the last three games or anything that stood out from say the phoenix game that concerns you the most um you know what i guess over the last three what's your what's your primary takeaway and we'll it will start with you ron yeah so reggie's lakers first of all i mean i hate to say it, reggie i don't know if you saw them against the warriors but uh draymond green was a splash brother on them last night i watched a couple like Dead to rights. And so the Lakers, to me, uh, felt like a game they should have won. And then you look at the Suns. Um, The one thing about the Suns, and this is where I think Carl Anthony Towns gives you this. And so it depends on the team they're playing. So in the last three, um, I think they're just fine. I I do think, like last night, what you saw from Anthony Edwards as far as hunting, finding the shot, making the smart pass, Mike Conley taking the shot we needed, but but Nikhil Alexander-Walker picking up the slack, Nas Reed a couple games ago going off. And so – Finding that balance of whose night is it, where are they going to come from? But when you look at specifically two scores and Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, the Wolves have to find a way to be to be able to like withstand, as they call it, the barrage. If, if there's a scoring barrage happening, can the Wolves come back and make the smart play to kind of slow it down? Uh, you watch South Carolina versus, versus Iowa. Caitlin Clark has natural barrage of score like she just it's just hard to stop her and then when you double triple team her somebody else on iowa hits the shot south carolina found a way whether it was easy baskets going to their big slowing the game down getting to the play set that they know works the best that's where the timberwolves for me i want to see this against the nuggets because the nuggets do score in bunches uh they feed off the energy of that crowd the crowd feeds off the energy of the team whenever they're in a multiple score like run if, if it's like steal layup dunk uh, block shot, layup, three-pointer, and then all of a sudden it's a timeout. That crowd feeds off of it. I want to see, can the Timberwolves fight through that? Can they find a way to not get in their own head? Can they realize they have one of the best players in basketball in Anthony Edwards? And going back to the Bulls, I grew up in that era with the Pistons just absolutely punching them in the mouth. At some point, I don't know when, Michael Jordan finally realized, you know what, I am just better. They are not going to let me score, so let me find ways to do it without always running into the lane, without always, and that's where that mid-range came from. That's where the three-pointer came from, where he realized, I got to be, and so for Anthony Edwards, it's going to be similar. Don't always rely on just the, the, the step back. If you have a secondary move, use it. So looking at that last three, I'm fine with it. I, I think this is a team that down the stretch that are number one C right now, we keep saying if Anthony Edwards finishes number one, he should be uh, NBA MVP, but of course last night, Shea, Shea Alexander Giltris or uh, Shea comes up and they're like, oh, he he should be the number one. He's the MVP. Look at what he did. Last. Come on. We're talking about the number one team and the number one player on the number one team. 
and we're still trying to give it to other people. So, but I, I'm fine with the last three games. Reggie, your take on the last three. So uh, I woke up this morning to a text from one of my best friends who lives in Phoenix, is an avid uh, Phoenix Suns fan, and he is concerned about the Suns. He said, quote, I kind of hate this Suns team. <laughs> but it's weird because, like, when they have those three superstars, you're like, man, look, shh, shh. You know, they're scary. And then we saw what happened when they played the Wolves. Um, and so, but then you have a performance like last night where they were down like 30 to the Clippers. And it was just like, what is going on here? What is wrong with this team? And so I think that kind of makes you a little a little scared of of guys like like uh they have on on the Suns. But yeah, I I think Denver out of the the last few like scare me the most just because like they're the champs. They have it cooking right now. They um, they have the same record as the Wolves. And, you know, I think tonight's game is going to be I hate that tonight's game is um, the second of a back to back. You know, you can you can flip it two different ways like, oh, the Wolves play last night. So, you know, keeping the momentum rolling or you can say, oh, well, they, they had to play really hard last night because they were favored to win by 17 and a half points coming into the game. And they were down 21 at one point and had to claw their way back to win uh, by double digits. But they still had to claw their way back to win. And so you you take the you take that one and you're like, OK, they had to exert a lot of energy. And now they're going to the high altitude in Denver. And I don't know that it's you know, people always mention the high altitude in Denver. Um I don't know if the players are used to it now or, you know, if it is that much of a difference maker. But, you know, even playing anywhere on the second night of a back to back, you know, you you probably are a little bit gassed a bit. And now you got, you know, Denver to contend with. So I think that kind of concerns me a little bit. But I think, look, I think they have a good chance to to finish number one is just a, a matter of, you know, how they play. I think the one thing that does concern me, we saw what happened when Cat came back last year. They have found such a way, and Nikhil kind of talked about this yesterday. They they found a way to find their roles without Cat being in the lineup. And now when you insert Cat back into the lineup, like, can they still find their roles to be efficient and help the team win because Cat is a bit ball dominant. You know, he's a catch and shoot guy. He likes to get his shots up. He can hold the ball quite a bit from time to time. And so I think that's going to be an interesting thing. I think, you know, with him coming back, if he comes back before the, the end of the regular season, I know we'll get into that in a bit, but maybe that kind of helps as they go into the postseason to kind of figure out some things, tinker with some things before they have to play some playoff basketball but i think that's the thing that kind of concerns me the most like what are they going to do when cat comes back how will they look how will they mesh anything from the last three games jack that stands out to you yeah i think you know when you look at the suns game that that's something that i think is the most concerning to me from a playoff perspective in that the suns were really one of the first teams we've seen all season play rudy gobert off the floor offensively, not defensively. Obviously, the Timberwolves' defense has been incredible, and there, and there hasn't really been anyone that's been able to figure out this Timberwolves' defense to the point where Rudy Gobert is the guy that the Wolves need to take off the floor. But but offensively, for the Wolves, I mean, Phoenix did an excellent job taking away Gobert on the roll. And he, he you know, outside of his offensive rebounding, there just wasn't a whole lot out there that he was able to do that was really productive and impactful for this team. And I think the, what Chris Finch did was he turned to Kyle Anderson to play the five so that they could get him more involved as a short role playmaker in the middle of the floor, you know, after he sets his screen and rolls and catches the ball at the free throw line, then can either get to that little floater, uh, attack the rim or, or spray the ball out for, for, you know, three point shots. And that's something that I think uh, when Carl Anthony Towns is back, that they'll try to use a, a lot more maybe in those matchups when opponents do try to take away Rudy Gobert on the roll. Um, and, and Again, Phoenix is the worst fourth quarter team in the league by a mile. Like it might be historically bad. I haven't had the time to run the numbers on on how bad it is historically. But um, yeah, I mean, the only problem was you just didn't. This game wasn't close enough in the fourth quarter for that to even matter. And and the Timberwolves just 
again, are a team that have, has honestly been pretty good playing from behind and coming back in some of these big games and, and winning these games. But they're just a team that's so much tougher to, you know, contend with when they have a lead and they're able to play from a, play from ahead. And so that's something that you'd like to at least see on Sunday, depending on whether or not that game matters. And then for the Lakers, you know, again, I don't think there's a whole lot you can glean from a game against the Lakers that doesn't have Anthony Davis or LeBron. But I do think it will be interesting in terms of how the Timberwolves match up with the Lakers in terms of defensive assignments that they do play them in the playoffs. I think that we've seen the last couple of games now, or, uh, Jade McDaniels guard D'Angelo Russell. And that's something that I'm keeping my eye on and have it circled just in the back of my mind. And that, you know, the, the Lakers have been a, a really good team. They've had like a 62% win percentage over the last three months, which is like a 52 win pace. That was from, from my guy, Jacob Rude, who, who covers the Lakers for, for SB Nation. Um, but, but the Lakers are 15 and 14 this season when D'Angelo Russell does not score at least 15 points. And so if Jade McDaniels can take d away, take him out of the game and, and maybe leave uh, LeBron for, for Kat or for Kyle Anderson or someone like that, that's something that I think would be really interesting, especially if it's able to help keep Jade McDaniels out of foul trouble. Yeah, the Suns matchup scares me a little bit for a lot of the reasons that we've talked about, but uh, we, we can talk more about that if if and hopefully not when that becomes a thing. All right, next up, I want to talk Wolves Nuggets. I want to talk Carl Anthony Towns return. We'll get to all that here next. Today's episode of Locked of the Locked On Minnesota Basketball Party is brought to us by our friends at Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. I'm a big baseball fan, and I tend to buy last minute for all sorts of things. And game time is the only place that I would go and feel comfortable buying last minute tickets. Uh, they also have seats for any other event you like to go to concerts, comedy, theater, et cetera. All of the above are things that my wife and I like to attend. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute for all of the above. Also they have flash deals, zone deals, all in pricing views from your seat and the lowest price guarantee. The lowest price guarantee means game time will credit you 110% of the difference. If you find a better price somewhere else, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Lockdown NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code Lockdown NBA. That's L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about Wolves Nuggets here tonight. Of course, the Wolves and Nuggets have played three games together to this or uh, against one another to this point. The Wolves are two and one against Denver. We've, of course, as always, you got to go back and look at who was playing, who wasn't. And the last time out, no Jamal Murray for Denver. There was a game, uh, of course, no cap for Minnesota. There was a game in there uh, with a few more guys out early, early in the season. The teams were mostly healthy when they played each other. The Wolves won that game. So the Wolves will have the tiebreaker over the Nuggets at this point. Regardless, the bigger issue is there's only three games left on the schedule for both the Wolves and Denver. So if the Wolves were to lose to Denver, they would need Denver to lose to one of, I think it's San Antonio or Memphis, and the Wolves would need to beat both Phoenix and Atlanta in order to still get the one seed. So this is effectively a game for the one seed in the Western Conference. And as we've already noted, the second night of a back-to-back, -back, traveling for the Wolves into altitude, back-to-back -back for Denver as well. Um, Carl Anthony Towns, uh, we're going to get to his return. It seems unlikely he would play Wednesday night against Denver. I guess it's still possible as of us recording the show right now, but I'm going to assume he's not playing. Um, let's just talk overall thoughts, what you're looking for out of this game. We've talked about this matchup before. It's obviously a difficult one with the defending champs, but one that the Wolves actually match up okay, a team that Wolves actually match up okay against. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the matchup here to start, Reggie? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, it was interesting because the, the Wolves – it was only a five game series when they played them in the playoffs last year, but I don't know. Am I crazy to think that I, I feel like the wolves kind of gave them more of a matchup than some of the other teams that they played down the stretch in the, in the playoffs last year, leading to the finals. Like it kind of felt like that to me. I don't, I don't Bruce know. Bruce Brown but, said as much. Bruce Brown said the wolves yeah. were the most difficult opponent that they faced in the playoffs last year. 
Yeah, and I know they only won one game of the five, and you know it's just it seems nonsensical to to say, but you know, like Ant was giving them buckets. I feel like he kind of became more of a star during that that playoff series, and you know, parlayed that into the season that he's having now. And you know, I think they they just naturally get up for the Nuggets. Like they have a, a we ain't scared um, <laughs> mindset when it comes to playing. The Nuggets. So I'm I'm looking forward to the matchups. I'm looking forward to how um you know Nas or Rudy or whoever they decide uh, match up against Jokic. Um we didn't talk about it, but that that elbow from Nas last night, I'm not really sure if I would have called that a flagrant two. I'm not really sure that that was ejection worthy. Um it didn't end up hurting the wolves, but it's so interesting too, because I think we've kind of mentioned this before, but the wolves match up well with Denver, even without cat being out there, you know? So even if cat doesn't play, like I still like the wolves chances to go out there and, and be able to get a win uh, in Denver. And so I'm interested to see how this matchup plays out. I'm interested to see how well Ant is going to play and, and how well, you know, some of the guys off the bench, um, Jordan McLaughlin, he he was two for three from the field last night, but he was plus 27 when he was on the court. So, you know, I'm, I'm just excited to see these matchups and excited to see, you know, how the Wolves perform on the second night of a back to back. Yeah, the Wolves have uh, they've tried a couple different things against Jokic. I mean, as every team does, right? Like generally speaking, last year in the playoffs, this is oversimplifying it, but it was basically being physical with him. It was putting cat on him and just saying, hey, cat, go guard Jokic for stretches. And then this last time out when the Wolves beat the Nuggets, uh, 111-98. They held them under 100 points. Of course, no Jamal Murray, but the Wolves didn't have Cat. And Nas didn't have a good game offensively. He had seven points and 12 shots in that game. And the strategy was much more like, and and this is, we're talking about the best player in the league, right? So, you know, making the best player in the league try and be a scorer seems like a silly strategy, but like, what are your options, right? It's There's no good option. And they turned Jokic into a scorer and he scored a lot early in the game and ended up with 32 points. But the Nuggets as a team only scored 98 because he only had five assists to four turnovers. He had some uncharacteristically bad passes late in that game. But um, I mean, what what are you looking for? Assuming Cat doesn't play in this game, Jack, from from this matchup, how the Wolves might defend Jokic and, and what to expect here in this battle for the number one seed? Yeah, I, I hate to pick on my guy, Reg, but but the altitude is is extremely real. Um, I, I talked to okay. my, I, look, I didn't know. I didn't know. You know, <laughs> people always talk about it. I, you know, I was curious about it less from the Timberwolves perspective, but more from the Nuggets perspective. So I asked Mike Conley in the locker room after the game last night, because Mike played in Utah for, for a few years and Utah is like a thousand feet lower than Denver, but still very much at altitude and very much different than any other, uh, NBA arena. That's not Denver. And, Mike basically said, yeah, you know, if if you leave and go anywhere and then come back, it doesn't matter if you are, you know, a Salt Lake City resident, if you've lived there your whole life, if, you know, you've lived there for three years and you're used to it every day, like there is still a definite adjustment period and you do not feel good the day that you get there. And if it's a back to back and you're playing up there, it's even worse than, you know, any other back to back. It's worse than if you would have normally you know, had it even a day to, to get in, let's say that the Timberwolves would have gotten in like two days ago or, you know, Monday night or something to prepare for this game today. Like it's just so different. And, and the fact that, um, you know, Denver played last night and, and then has to come back home, uh, you know, travel overnight. It's De the Denver airports like 40 minutes away from any, uh, any other part of civilization, which just makes that second night of a back-to-back -back even more difficult for both teams. So, um, so there's a lot going on there and it's going to be really interesting just to see who plays, you know, Aaron Gordon hasn't played in the last two games for them because of a foot strain. Jamal Murray missed six games with right knee inflammation, came back Saturday and then played last night. And, and it seems unlikely that he would play on the second night of a back to back, but we'll see. And then once you get out on the floor, it, for me, it's all about how you're able to defend Jokic, right? The Timberwolves have defended Jokic as well as probably any team in the West. I know the Knicks have done an excellent job of defending Jokic this season as well, but they've held him under 50% shooting in three of the last four games, and, and it's the and he's, he's had three games in a row against the Timberwolves of recording five or less assists. Timberwolves have mixed up looks really well on him. They've been really aggressive and brought double teams to him. Um, they've played that, that spy Rudy coverage that you're talking about, Ben, where, where you have Carl Anthony Towns or Nas Reed or Kyle Anderson take, 
the Jokic assignment with Rudy kind of floating and protecting the rim, sagging off of Aaron Gordon in the back. So if Aaron Gordon doesn't play, I think it'll be really interesting to see who Rudy Gobert guards and how they handle that matchup just because, um, you know, Denver, you know, I'm not exactly sure who they would start. Um, in, in that case, I don't think they would also start Reggie Jackson. Maybe they, they start someone like Peyton Watson off the bench there. Um, so, so that'd be kind of interesting to see if Rudy Gobert would guard him. I think for me, it's just all about the way that they're going to mix up coverages on, on Nikola Jokic and, and whether they're going to be more aggressive or more conservative and, and how much they're going to try to junk the game up. Um, and, and I just think it'll be interesting to see how, how hard the Nuggets really push in this game because I, you know, Jokic said last night, I think it was kind of, kind of kidding a little bit and that it's, it wasn't a huge game for them, but, but I don't really think it is a big game for the Nuggets. You know, the Nuggets just won a title last year. They don't have to prove anything to anybody. They just want to be healthy and get into the playoffs. And I think they'd feel good about whatever matchup they have, whether it's they have home court advantage or not. Whereas I think the Timberwolves have way more to prove and getting the number one seed would mean a lot more to them than it would to the Nuggets. And, um, you know, would really be a confidence booster for them. Whereas the Nuggets have kind of already proven they can beat anybody in a seven game series. So I would not be surprised at all to see Aaron Gordon and Jamal Murray both sit this game and the Timberwolves have a little bit of an easier time, um, you know, getting a season sweep in, in Denver, but, but we'll see. Yeah. And to your point, Jack, like for whatever it's worth, if the Nuggets get the two seed or even the three seed at this point, which seems unlikely, but the two or the three seed, um, I mean, they're still gonna be the favorite in the Western conference in terms of over at FanDuel, right? Like everybody's going to say, okay, the Nuggets are going to win the West, regardless of whether or not the Wolves have the one seed. So, uh, I mean, and it, surely I could see the defending champs having that sort of an attitude. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're the defending champs. Uh, Ron, your thoughts on Wolves Nuggets tonight. Yeah. I mean, I've been to Denver three times, I think in the past year now. And uh, I will say it's, it is a little weird feeling at first uh, when you get there. Like it's just, you just can feel it. It's different. Um, as far as my daughter's sports, she's played both softball and volleyball there. And so um People do talk about that. They say the ball floats a little bit different in volleyball. They say in softball, the ball takes off a little bit easier and gets out the park a little bit quicker. Um, so there's a lot to that. This is an indoor sport, which volleyball is as well. And so um, it, it does have a slight, not much, a slight difference. But that's what pregame warmups is for. That's what guys go out there two or three hours before and shoot around to get used to it. Um, the good thing is they're 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 they they're not there for a long time. They're just in and out. So mentally is turning it over is drink a ton of water i think that's the other part of the 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 sustain in that difference is like making sure your blood your blood and um so your o2 levels or whatever um you have enough water in there to deal with that and, and kind of generate and and be able to recover carl of the towns <clears throat> if he does play here's the thing i think about carl of the towns what he needs to be for even for round one of the playoffs he needs to come off the bench he needs to be a secondary, like he needs to come in and be a role player to the point where, where he's in with the second group, he's now the guy. And now he can come in and take over. Also with Jokic tonight, what I want to see, I want to see how they handle him. Do they throw multiple bigs at him? Do they make sure Nas Reed and Rudy Gobert and Jaden uh, McDaniels are always like able to touch him, able to keep a body on him, keep an arm on him? Are they able to make sure when they're in the pick and switch, they're not getting caught with Jamal Murray? So that's t tonight is kind of like a mini, maybe a Western Conference final mini like warm up for Finch in the, in the Timberwolves to say, here's how we can handle them. Now, whether they win the game or not, I think the biggest thing is people don't want to see a blowout. If they get blown out, everybody's going to go to negative. Everybody's going to go to like, ah, oh, see, this is why we don't talk about the Timberwolves. This is why we keep talking about the Warriors and the Lakers. It has to be a close game down the stretch. Even if they lose, they have to be in this. But I do believe that going at Jokic, that's the key. Finding a way, like treat Jokic like Caitlin Clark. Find a way to get the ball out of his hand. Find a way to keep him from being the true facilitator at all times. If you can push him around a little bit, aggravate him, piss him off, that's what I want to see. Not to say get a tech, not Draymond a bit, but be a little bit more physical on the night too as well because they're both coming off, off, off games. And so everybody's going to be tired and just see who has the ability to be able to push through it. Hey, if you dream on the bit, he had five threes last night. So if you dream on the bit, you might be all right. Hey, that that would be for for Nas Reed. You can shoot, hit, hit five for five on threes, and also be a little bit of a bully on Jokic. Uh, but yeah, five for five on threes from from Nas tonight. I, hey, I don't think any Timberwolves fan would be mad at that.
All right, so Ron gave us his take already a little bit on Carl Anthony Towns. I want to talk about his return here next because there is a little bit of uh, breaking news as recording the show about when Cat may return. So I want to talk about that next. We'll also do some uh, quick hits or a, a shot clock, maybe more of a college shot clock, a little bit longer shot clock here in a minute. Uh, we'll do all that here next. Today's episode of the Locked On Minnesota Basketball Party is brought to us by our friends over at BetterHelp. The show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. Today, I want to say how I really feel about something. You may be thinking about the same thing this week, and we're not going to get into the weeds on this one here today on the show. But, I mean, Chris Finch is still over at FanDuel, only plus, plus 550 for Coach of the Year. Mark Dagno is minus 500. It's been a few weeks since we've talked with us on the basketball party, but Mark Dagno has SGA. SGA is one of the best five or six players in the league. And yeah, Ant is probably now in the top 15, top 12 conversation, but all year SGA has been incredible. And, you know, everybody knew the Thunder were going to be good when they got healthy. And so it's not a surprise that they're, and they may still finish third in the West. So it's not like they're the Celtics. It's not like they're a 65 win team with a top six player. Um, it's a little surprising to me that those odds have such a gap between Dagno and Chris Finch. Again, Dagno at minus 500, Chris Finch at plus 550. Look, many of us have bigger problems in complaining about our favorite team's coach not winning or likely not winning the Coach of the Year awards or the odds about award season. But it's still important to get things off your chest, and therapy can look different for everyone. If you're thinking of starting therapy, consider giving BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockdownNBA to get 10% off your first month. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockdownNBA. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about Carl Anthony Towns. So as of right now, we're recording this Wednesday morning. There was a, a Sham Shrani, a tweet that came out that uh, was – Vaguely specific, if you will, that that cat will return to action either tonight against Denver Friday or Sunday. I had speculated this is purely speculation on Lockdown Wolves that Friday made more sense versus, you know, yeah, he could give them a shot in the arm on Wednesday on a back to back at altitude. But do you really want him coming back at altitude against a Jokic matchup? Probably not. Right. So I'd be surprised if he plays Wednesday. I don't know if the teams if they put out like an actual injury report as of this recording. I, I don't think they have. Um so Friday seems to make sense. It's the weakest opponent of the three. It's Atlanta. So maybe he plays Friday and then 36 hours later, maybe you don't play him against Phoenix in the regular season finale, or maybe you do and you limit his minutes. Uh, Ron already suggested maybe you bring him off the bench. Um, there's a lot of different angles we could take this. We don't have a ton of time left on the show today, but um, Jack, let's start with you. What what are you looking for out of a cat return? I guess, what are your thoughts on Ron's thoughts about bringing him off the bench? And you know what uh, what are you looking for most when when Towns comes back? Yeah, I've heard that Friday is the day that that people have circled. Chris Finch said pregame last night that Carl still has some uh, some cardio work that he, that he needs to do uh, in, in the coming days. Was, was his words. So um, we'll we'll see what that ends up being. But yeah, I just think the biggest thing for Carl is he's got to be more of a three point shooter with with the starting five. Um, you know, I think Ron's point is is definitely an interesting one. I think that it would make more sense for Carl to come off the bench if he had a if he had a pretty restrictive minutes limit. If he was only able to play 15 or 20 minutes, I think that that would make a lot more sense. But, you know, if he's able to play closer to 25 or 30 minutes, it, it makes more sense to me to start him and that, you know, he's got to get as much time with the starting five as he can. And, and part of why the, the Timberwolves offense has been as successful as it has with Cat uh, down is that they've really done a great job of spacing the floor and, and moving the ball and making quick decisions and getting up good three point looks as a result. And, and Nas Reed has taken seven threes a game at a 44% clip. And he's made a ton of quick decisions without turning the ball over, um, you know, all that much. I know he's had a couple of really bad games, but, but in the macro has been, has been pretty good. Um, I mean, he's taken more threes than Carl has as a starter. Carl, Carl only gets up about five threes a game at a 42% clip. So if he can convert a couple of those drives, a couple of those weird post ups, 17 feet away from the basket into three point shots, I think that's going to help everyone else around him just have more room to operate and be able to do so more efficiently. Um, you know, and, and then I think, you know, the other thing, too, is that Carl can still, you know, low block post up. I, I think that's a if he's got one on one coverage down there. I'd take that every single time. He's one of the most efficient post-up players in the, in the league when he's down in the low block, especially in that left left block post-up. Uh, they can run split action off of that to get you know shooter going off the ball, whether that's Conley or Jaden McDaniels. 
And and I'm also really curious, like I said previously against the, you know, in that Suns matchup is, is can they get more of his short roll playmaking where he sets his screen and catches the ball at the free throw line um, or a little bit below that. And then he can spray the ball out to corner shooters. That'll be something that'll be for me interesting to watch, especially if he's playing with, um, you know, more of that second unit that can, that can space the floor a little bit better. We've seen Jordan McLaughlin uh, get a lot of wide open corner three point looks. Same with Nikhil Alexander Walker. Both have been, been really good of late. So that'll be really, really interesting to me. But, but I think for, for Carl to break out more of that driving and more of those, you know, nail post ups and isolations, I think that makes a lot more sense with the second unit. But again, I mean, it comes with the huge caveat of, you know, how healthy is he going to be? Is he going to feel really good about driving? A ton with, with that knee is he going to feel really good about isolating a ton in the, in the open floor or is he just going to want to get up more threes and, and and do some lower impact stuff until he feels more confident so it'd be interesting to see play out but but i do agree that that friday makes a, a lot more sense than than doing doing it tonight yeah and it'll be interesting to see i mean you as you were talking through that jack like um Nas has been shooting more threes than cat did when he was in the starting lineup and and more threes is always a good thing for Carl Anthony Towns. And I think sometimes, ironically, when he was on the floor, the spacing wasn't quite as good, even though he's their best shooter, because he and Finch likes to do this, too. They like to post him up kind of in that that elbow extended free throw line extended almost the Jokic spot on the floor a little bit. They like to put him at the nail, which is effective. But then sometimes and I worry that if they do that now, does Cat think of himself too much as a Jokic like facilitator, like, uh, you know, my knee's not 100 percent. I don't want to push it from the mid post, I'm just going to sling a, a pass to the opposite corner and turn the ball over that sort of a thing that worries me a little. If he could play more of a role like Nas and, and feel good enough to be dynamic and still, you know, uh, face up and take guys off the dribble. We'll see, but it'll be interesting to see how they, if it's just back to normal or if he's a lesser part of the offense or if they use him differently. And Chris French said too, that Car- you know, in, in no certain terms, that Carl has to make quicker decisions. He said that Carl has come to the coaching staff saying, Hey, these are some things that I've noticed I need to do better that I've been seeing that's been working with everyone while I've been out. And, and Finch has said that they've really hammered home the point with him of, of whatever you're doing, you've got to do it quicker because that's been the foundation of the offense's success. And that's always been an issue with cat at times it comes and goes, right? Like I remember that being an issue last year early where Ant even said it publicly, like cats just got to go quicker. Like when he goes quick, we're good. Um, and, and I think that's hundred percent true. Uh, Reggie, your thoughts on, uh, on cats return and what you're looking for. Really? You guys nailed it. That, that was really my point. Like he's got to be a catch and shoot guy. He's got to be a guy that, you know, makes a determination of what, what he wants to do, whether he's going to pass it, whether he's going to put the ball on the floor, take it to the cup. Like, he just has to be a quick decision maker because he has been known to slow the offense down a bit when he's out there on the court. And we we've grown to see, you know, a little bit more offensive efficiency from the Wolves. But, you know, even with Cat in the lineup, the Wolves have been one of the the bottom tier offensive efficient teams in the league. And that's with top flight scorers like Ant and like Cat and being able to get the ball to Rudy in his spots to score. So I think he has to be a, a spark plug, as 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 Ron said. I don't know if, if coming off the bench is the is the idea. I don't know what he would think about <laughs> coming off the bench. You know, we had the 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 comeback last year where he, you know, was telling Leah, you know, this is what movies is made of. You know, we we saw that cat last year. Um, and so I, I think he kind of hit the ground running and just kind of fit back in. And so hopefully, you know, he's, I I like, you know, Jack, that he has had some self-awareness to kind of look and, you know, Cat has shown himself to be a bit of a student of the game. Um, and so, you know, he has found a way to, you know, look at things from the outside in and, and figure out a way to try to work his way back into the to the lineup in a way that helps the team. So if he can continue to do that and he can just add to what, you know, the good juju that the wolves have, have built with him being out, I think it'll be a good, a good situation for all parties. Ron, final thoughts on, uh, on cats return. Yeah, for me, I'm, I'm sticking with it. I think he needs to come off the bench. Um, whether it is, if he even if he has 30 minutes, um, I think he just should come off the bench. And and the only reason for it is one, um, not having an expectation coming in as a starter to say you need to give us starter type production right now. Um, again, my goal for him, if I'm a trainer, if I'm the coaches, if I'm himself, I'm gonna push for that second round. Not to say the first round is a given, 
if you're the number one or number two seed, it should be a given. And so they should be looking at round two and then the final. And that's that's the big the Western Conference final. That's that would be my target to say, you know what, we need you to be a starter for when we have to go up against whoever in the second round and then in the Western Conference final versus the Nuggets. Like that's what we need you for. And and so him coming back, one, you can get key minutes with the starters in the second quarter, maybe in the third quarter, maybe in the fourth quarter. But to start the game, I just feel like you bring him in and say, hey, look, you're going to come in for Nas or you're going to come in for Rudy or whatever it might be. And now it's your turn to go at Jokic. So what Jokic ends up getting is a barrage. He doesn't have a minute to rest. And if they take Jokic out thinking like, all right, Gobert's out, Jokic can come out. Now Cat's out there against somebody who probably can't guard him. And now you're playing that game with them of making them use their guys when you don't when they don't want to use them. Uh, it becomes like a, a a college. I forgot the college. It might have been Arkansas. I can't remember who it was, but they had like ten players, and he literally was just going five in, five out, five in, five out. He was just throwing guys at guys, and they just could not keep up. I think it was Arkansas. Um, but you got to have that mentality with this team. You got so many players. Find a, a second group of five with Cat to say, hey, look, now we can just dump the ball down and tell me you can get real work. We need you to be this guy while the starters are out on the bench or whatever. And maybe Anthony Edwards is the only starter that stays out. But that's that's what I see for for Cat. It'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, obviously when he comes back, you know, what what kind of minutes he's playing and, and what the rotation looks like over the final three games of the regular season. All right, let's go quick here at the end. We've got a shot clock round. We're going to call it a college shot, old school college shot clock. Let's go 35 seconds, like like back in the day, college shot clock. Uh, for each of these, we've got three quick topics. We'll go around in a circle. We'll start with this first one with you, Ron. Uh, overall college basketball thoughts, uh, take it in whatever direction you want. UConn wins on the men's side, South Carolina, on the women's side. Uh, what are your thoughts on college basketball championships over the last few days, Ron? Oh, uh, well, one, the women's was way more exciting this year. I mean, they just had way more, uh, uh, storylines. They had way more energy. It was, it was more watched. Um, the men, it felt good to start, and then UConn just took over. I, I don't remember a team being as dominant in every single – like UConn never really felt like anybody could play with them this season. And I feel bad for not picking them. I was hoping North Carolina and Duke in the final. Not even close. Purdue, I thought you were going to let me down. You made it to the final, so hats off. But Caitlin Clark is an absolute beast. The one thing I will say, I feel bad for the Iowa Wolves, and I'm going to pay off the tees, because you guys got to live in Iowa with those people. I got community noted, which means somebody in the community of Iowa – felt the need to report me to Twitter because my tweet had reached 5 million views to say that it's false. My opinion is not false. It's the referees and it's basketball. The fact that that call wasn't called, that moving screen, quote unquote, wasn't called against Caitlin Clark. The push on Caitlin Clark wasn't called. The offensive foul, okay, it's always objective by the referee so there's no way you can call my claim false that is absolute bs the iowa people of iowa you are bored but clearly you are still stuck over the fair catch it was an illegal fair catch signal get over it you they did want you in the finals i didn't lie about that now the fact that maybe it wasn't an, a, a moving screen whatever you want who cares they wanted them in the finals they got it and that's that I guess, uh, Reggie, if you want to give your opinion on Iowa, go for it. But uh, otherwise, uh, UConn, South Carolina, et cetera, whatever you want to say at this point. Look, man, South Carolina was the dominant team all season. And, you know, to be an undefeated team, I think there was a lot of talk about Kalen Clark, and rightfully so. But I feel like there wasn't a lot of talk about South Carolina and the dominance that they had. And what we saw in that, that Final Four in that championship game was that they are a force. I mean, Camilla Cardoso, you got St. Michael's own Tessa Johnson getting buckets, Tony Tessa. That was incredible to see. I, I think she probably starts next year, um, win a championship your freshman season. That's incredible. And so it, it was interesting, though, because I watched that game and we were thoroughly entertained in that final. The next night, watched – the the UConn Purdue game and the offensive sets that UConn ran it seemed like especially in that second half somebody was always open after past two or three somebody was always open on the wing in the corner four or three and they were knocking them down they just felt like if I was out there and I was playing on Purdue I'd be like Haley Van Lith when Kaylin Clark is making she's just like 
I, I don't know what else to do to defend that. But it's just interesting, you know, Ron mentioned it. When you saw the numbers, the numbers showed the women's game is just much more popular right now. Jack, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm glad the Twitter mod community is protecting Ron's takes from – or protecting the community from Ron's takes. Um, so so shout out to them. But, uh, yeah, I, I only watched the women's game. Um, I watched Molly's game during the uh, the men's game on Netflix. Great movie if anyone's looking for, for a nice little two hours. Uh, but, yeah, in the women's game, I, I thought it was, a, it was a ton of fun to watch. I was just so impressed by how South Carolina – I think they outscored – I was benched 37 nothing and put up an absurd like 225 to, to 50 uh, bench points uh, margin over the course of the whole tournament. The way that they got contributions, like you said, Reg, from from not only Tessa Johnson, but from Malaysia full Wiley off the bench, too, was uh, was just incredible. And, and I think it was just, you know, the entire season, Iowa had struggled to get consistent production from players not named Caitlin Clark and Kate Martin and for them to. Uh, and for them to, you know, show how how deep they are, uh, South Carolina did on, on that stage. I think was incredible. Anthony Edwards was super fired up in the locker room last night for uh, for the the player he calls his daughter Raven Johnson um, from from Atlanta. He was he was super fired up and um, and was just you know effusive in how you know proud he was of, of Raven playing defense on Caitlin Clark for those final three quarters. And so, yeah, just just super super happy for for Don Staley and everyone with, with South Carolina because, you know, it was a it was a crazy dominant season capped off by a crazy dominant you know final three quarters for them. Yeah, South Carolina dominant on the women's side, UConn dominant on the men's side. The one note on UConn that was floating around there is the greatest point differential over the course of a men's tournament in the history of the men's tournament, plus one forty over six games for Connecticut, which is crazy. Um, absolutely crazy. And it was like, I think the Kentucky team in the mid nineties that, that they, uh, that they, uh, were better than, um, all right, we're going to skip down to predicting the week for the wolves. Let's go quick here. Three games upcoming this week. Of course, the nuggets game tonight, home for Atlanta Friday night, and then home for a, a matinee to close the season on Sunday against the Phoenix suns. What's everybody, everybody got for the week. Uh, Jack, we'll start with you. I've got two and one. I think they win tonight in Denver. I think they beat Atlanta on Friday to clinch the number one seed and Sunday won't matter. So I don't think they'll take that all too seriously. So I think they go two and one run. Uh, I was going to say two and one as well. I think they might lose tonight, beat Atlanta and then beat Phoenix to get the number one seed. Reggie. Yeah, I go two and one as well. They'll get one of the two between tonight or Phoenix and then they beat Atlanta. I'll be pessimistic. I'll say one and two. I, I think they lose in Denver and lose to Phoenix and beat Atlanta Friday. But um, the most important thing is going to be what they look like with Cat on the floor and also obviously keeping everybody healthy. goes without saying over the next week. Of course, next week we'll have a bit of a better beat on what the playoffs are going to look like for the Wolves. We'll be in the midst of the play-in tournament, so we may not know for sure who the Wolves will match up against. But we'll be able to start shifting into playoff mode next week. Sam will be back and we'll be able to keep us uh, to a, a tidier time on this show, I'm sure. Uh, that's all we got for you today here on the Minnesota Basketball Party. A big thank you for watching here on YouTube or listening on Locked on Wolves. We do this every Wednesday, and uh, you know we'll do this throughout the playoffs, of course. So hopefully it's a really long run into June. Be sure to tune back in next Wednesday. A big thank you for watching and listening today, and have a good one.